In this lecture, we're going to focus on business contracts. Now, a typical definition of a contract is a legal agreement between two parties to exchange rights and obligations. Most people are familiar with contracts because they participated in them. For example, if you want to make a phone call and you have a cell phone, you've got a, an agreement, a contract, with, this, with the mobile phone company to have access to their cell towers and in exchange you're making the, their payments. But the question then comes up is what do contracts have to do with financial statements? The focus of this course is financial statement analysis. So how is there that connection between business contracts? Well, to answer that, financial statement information is often used in business contracts. Suppliers want to know if uh, who they sell to is going to be able to pay them, so they look at the financial statements. The customer who has a 20-year warranty wants to make sure that who they're buying from is going to be around for 20 years. Human resources and the labor union often look at financial statements in their contracts to determine what will occur. Um, supply chain, you want to make sure that the uh, who you're depending on in the supply chain is going to come through, so you look at the financial statements to see if uh, they're strong. And then finally, uh, loans, right? Um, if you're going to get a loan from a bank or a lending institution, they want to know, hey, are you going to be able to pay them back? So they look at the financial statements and they use those in the contracting mechanism. Oftentimes in these contracts, though, we run into a conflict of interest. And a conflict of interest is basically when what's good for one party is not good for the other. And what we would rather have is the interests of both parties align so that what's good for one is good for the other. So we'll look at maybe ways we can do that. Now the two parties in a contract are called the principal and the agent. So the, the relationship between the principal and agent is that the agent is supposed to act in a certain way that's in the best interest of the principal. Oftentimes you see this with the owners of a business and the management. The management is the agent and they're supposed to act in certain ways that are in the best interest of the ownership. However, what's good for the management is not always what's good for the, you know, for the owners of the business. So if you own a business and you have a manager to run it and the manager wants to take a, a, an extra long lunch to uh, meet up with an old friend, it's good for the manager but it's not necessarily good for the owner we definitely have a conflict of interest there. So what, what can we do about that? Well, they call this agency cost because a lot of times you have to monitor the agent to ensure that that person is doing what's in best interest of the uh, principal. So for example, you might have to set up some kind of a system to monitor the, the manager. And the cost of that system, you know, security system for example, can be uh, quite expensive and it's something the principal is going to end up paying. However, when you think about it, it's not just the principal who bears the cost of monitoring the manager. The manager also bears some of that cost. It's indirect, but the manager will often not, times not make as much money because the, the owners don't have as much remaining as, as a, in profits to help you know, with the salary of the manager. In other words, by spending a lot of money on security, they don't have as much left over to pay for salaries. So you can see that, that, that agency costs can go both ways. The same conflict of interest occurs with uh, lending. So the lender has a conflict of interest with the lendee. The lender wants to make sure that the lendee is going to pay the loan back and doesn't do things with the loan money that could be detrimental to the company. And so how can we deal with that conflict of interest? Let's say the business takes out a loan and they're supposed to buy extra equipment for their, for their construction division. But instead of buying the extra equipment for the construction division, they do something else with the money. Now they don't have this, the, a stronger construction division in order to get the additional revenue to pay the loan back. So they've done something that's detrimental to paying the loan back. That's a conflict of interest. So what we can do? Well, the lender can charge more interest because we have an added risk, we charge more interest. Or we can add to the contract. We can put additional stipulations on the contract to ensure that they act the way that we expect them to act. They spend the money on the equipment in this example. So the debt covenants will preserve the capacity to repay the loan. The company will stay strong. They'll also stop from doing any kind of credit damaging events like, for example, 
by not paying another loan, they're actually damaging their credit, you know, and that can and that's not in the best interest of the lender. And they can also provide us with an advanced warning system. They can give us signals and triggers to look for on the financial statements. So if the financial statements are required to be provided to the lender at certain times, the lender then now has the ability to look for potential issues that could occur in advance. So one way that we can structure these covenants, these debt covenants, is through what they call an affirmative covenant. So with an affirmative covenant, it tells the managers what they must do. Some examples of affirmative covenant can include you know, the use of the loan for the intended purpose. You took out a loan to buy additional equipment for your construction division, you used the loan for that purpose. Another example could be to provide financial information. In other words, every quarter you're going to provide the following information to the bank. Um, another one could be to comply with laws. Um, that sounds maybe it sounds a little bit silly, but if a company doesn't comply with the laws, you know they do something illegal, then that could cause a lot of problems for the company to stay viable for the long haul. And those are just some examples. So notice how all of these things are telling the managers what they need to do. In contrast, a negative covenant says what the managers can't do, what they, what they are not supposed to do. Some examples of items you might find in a negative covenant could be something like taking out more debt. So you already take out one loan, now you're not allowed to take out more loans because that could affect your credit worthiness. Use the money for something else. Uh, maybe they set up a ratio like uh, take the current ratio and they said the current ratio is 1.5 to 1. It cannot fall below that. So now managers have to act in a way to make sure that the current assets stay at a certain level. Now various things can occur that will cause the managers to go into a default situation. First would be not to repay the loan, and that's obvious. Another thing would be to, to lie. In other words, to, to do an inaccuracy in their representation. So put something on the financial statements that's not accurate. You could also run into a situation where you don't repay other debt. They call that cross default. And then going into bankruptcy, that could cause you to be into some kind of a default situation. If we do go into default, what do, what do we do about that? What happens? Well, it depends on the situation. Sometimes they might renegotiate the loan and, and basically they can renegotiate any part of the loan. Another thing they can do is to just overlook it. With a technical default, you're paying the loan but you're not following the other rules in the debt covenant. So for example, let's say you're paying the loan, but your current ratio, which was supposed to stay at 1.5 to 1, has fallen below that. You're now in a technical default situation. So these defaults can be very costly. Whenever we, whenever we default on a loan, we can run into a lot of costs that are associated with that. So there's definitely an incentive for the management to make accounting choices so that they don't violate those debt covenants. Making accounting decisions not in the best interest of the presentation of the financial statements. Then there is a situation where the rules change on management. So the management, say, makes, makes up a whole default covenant and they're doing their best to follow all the rules. And then lo and behold, the FASB goes out and changes GAAP, because GAAP does change, changes quite regularly. So when they make these changes to GAAP, all of a sudden when we present our financial statements, we've fallen below a certain limit. So let's say our, our current ratio used to be 1.5 to 1. It would still be that, except that they've, they've made changes into how we report our prepaid expenses. And now because our prepaid expenses are part of current assets, all of a sudden it's fallen below 1.5 to 1. So that is not the fault of the management. They're not doing anything differently than they were before, but they're in this situation where in the default because the rules change were how we report our, our financial statements. So what they do is they set up fixed gap, meaning even though to the rest of the world they have to report the financial statements best on gap, in this situation, we're going to report based on the way GAAP was when we set up our contract for our loan. So we set the loan up the way it originally was under the GAAP rules that originally were set up that way. And then that's how we're going to report our, in this case, our current ratio. Now those changes to GAAP 
don't cause us to go into default when the management didn't really do anything that would otherwise have caused a default.